The Enigma of the Somerton Man, a mystery unsolved. The Somerton Man, also known as the Tam Amshid case, is a mysterious unsolved death case that occurred in 1948 on the beach at Somerton Park in Adelaide, South Australia. The case has garnered significant attention due to the unknown identity of the victim, the circumstances of his death, and the cryptic clues associated with the case. The case is named after the Persian phrase Tam Am Shud, which means is over or is finished. This phrase was discovered on a scrap of paper found in the fob pocket of the man's trousers several months after his body was found. The scrap was torn from the final page of a copy of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, a collection of poems by the 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. A public appeal by the police led to the discovery of the book from which the page had been torn. Inside the back cover of the book, detectives found indentations left from previous handwriting, including a local telephone number, an unidentified number, and text that appeared to be a coded message. Despite numerous attempts, this code has not been deciphered or interpreted in a way that satisfies the authorities. The case has been a subject of intense speculation and has been considered one of Australia's most profound mysteries. Several factors contribute to the ongoing public interest in the case, including the timing of the death during the early years of the Cold War, the involvement of a secret code, the possibility of an undetectable poison being used, and the authorities' inability or unwillingness to identify the deceased man. In July 2022, Adelaide University professor Derek Abbott, working in collaboration with genealogist Colleen M. Fitzpatrick, claimed to have identified the Somerton man as Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker born in 1905. This identification was based on genetic genealogy techniques applied to DNA extracted from the man's hair. However, South Australia Police and Forensic Science South Australia did not officially verify this result at the time, though they expressed hope in being able to do so. The discovery and initial investigation of the Somerton Man case are marked by a series of intriguing details and enigmatic circumstances. Discovery of the Body On December 1, 1948, at 6.30 a.m., authorities were notified after the body of an unidentified man was found on Somerton Park Beach, near Glenelg, approximately 11 kilometers, 7 miles, southwest of Adelaide, South Australia. The man was discovered lying in the sand across from the crippled children's home, situated at the corner of the Esplanade and Bickford Terrace. He was reclined with his head resting against the seawall, legs extended, and feet crossed. His posture suggested he had passed away while sleeping. Notably, an unlit cigarette was found on the right collar of his coat. Personal items and clues. Upon examining the man's pockets, authorities discovered various personal items including an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from the city that may not have been used, a narrow aluminum comb manufactured in the USA, a partially used packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an Army Club cigarette packet containing seven cigarettes of a different brand Kensitas, and a quarterful box of Bryant and May matches. Witness testimonies. Several witnesses came forward, reporting that on the evening of November 30th, they had observed an individual resembling the deceased, lying on his back in the same spot where his body was later found. Witnesses provided varying accounts, with some noting that they saw him extend his right arm to its fullest extent before letting it drop limply. Another couple, who observed him between 7.30 p.m. and 8 p.m., mentioned that they did not witness any movement, though they had the impression that his position had changed. While they found it odd that he did not react to mosquitoes, they believed he was either drunk or asleep, leading them not to investigate further. One witness informed the police that she saw a man looking down at the sleeping man from the top of the steps leading to the beach. In 1959, another witness came forward, reporting that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Somerton Park Beach the night before the body was discovered which was documented in a police report by Detective Don O'Doherty. Pathologist Findings Pathologist John Burton Cleland examined the body and estimated the man to be of Britisher appearance and approximately 40 to 45 years old. The man was in excellent physical condition and possessed unique physical attributes, including gray eyes, fair to ginger-colored hair with slight graying at the temples, broad shoulders, a narrow waist, hands and nails indicating no manual labor. 
and feet with big and little toes meeting in a wedge shape, resembling those of a dancer or someone who regularly wore pointed toe boots. He also had pronounced high calf muscles consistent with individuals who wore high-heeled boots or engaged in ballet. Clothing and lack of identification, the deceased was dressed in a white shirt, a red, white, and blue tie, brown trousers, socks and shoes, a brown knitted pullover, and a fashionable gray and brown double-breasted jacket reportedly of American tailoring. Notably, all labels on his clothing had been removed, and he had no hat, unusual for 1948, or wallet. He was clean-shaven and carried no identification, leading the police to consider suicide as a possibility. Additionally, his dental records did not match any known person. Autopsy and Findings An autopsy was conducted during which it was estimated that the man had died around 2 a.m. on December 1st. The autopsy revealed several anomalies, including congestion in the brain's blood vessels, a widening of the mucosa in the pharynx and ulceration in the gullet, deep congestion in the stomach, blood mixed with the food in the stomach, and congestion in the duodenum. Furthermore, both kidneys were congested, the liver contained an excess of blood in its vessels, and the spleen was unusually large, about three times the normal size. Microscopic examination indicated destruction in the center of the liver lobules. The pathologist, Dr. Dwyer, suspected that the death could not have been natural and suggested poisoning, specifically a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. However, the source of the poisoning, if it occurred, was not identified, with the pasty the man had eaten not believed to be the source. Unidentified and embalmed, Despite the autopsy, the coroner was unable to determine the man's identity, the cause of death, or whether the man seen alive at Somerton Beach on the evening of November 30th was indeed the same person, as nobody had seen his face at that time. With no positive identification, the body was embalmed on December 10, 1948, marking the first time the police deemed such action necessary. On January 14, 1949, staff at the Adelaide Railway Station made a significant discovery when they found a brown suitcase with its label removed in the station's cloakroom. This suitcase had been checked into the cloakroom after 11 a.m. on November 30, 1948, a date that coincided with the time when the unidentified man was seen alive. It was strongly suspected that this suitcase belonged to the man found deceased on Somerton Park Beach. The contents of the suitcase were quite intriguing and added another layer of mystery to the case. Inside the suitcase, investigators found a red check dressing gown, a pair of size 7 red felt slippers for pairs of underpants, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician screwdriver, a table knife that had been cut down into a short, sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc that appeared to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush, commonly used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Also inside the suitcase was a thread card containing Barber brand orange wax thread of an unusual type, not available in Australia. This thread was identical to the type used to repair the lining in one of the pockets of the trousers the deceased man was wearing. Despite all identification marks having been removed from the clothing, the police discovered the name T, Keen on a tie, Keen on a laundry bag, and Keen on a singlet. Additionally, they found three dry cleaning marks, 1171-7, 4393-7, and 3053-7. Police believed that the person who removed the clothing tags either overlooked these three items or intentionally left the Keen tags on the clothes, knowing that Keen, was not the dead man's name. The absence of spare socks in the suitcase and the lack of any correspondence raised suspicions. Typically, it was common practice to use name tags, but it was also common to remove the tags of previous owners when buying secondhand clothing. What made this case unusual was the absence of spare socks and correspondence, although pencils and unused letter stationery were found. The search for a missing person named T keen in any English-speaking country proved fruitless. Similarly, a nationwide circulation of the dry-cleaning marks yielded no results. An analysis of the clothing in the suitcase revealed that the front gusset and feather stitching on a coat indicated it had been manufactured in the United States. Notably, this coat had not been imported, suggesting that the man had either been to America or obtained the coat from someone of similar size who had been there. 
The police conducted investigations into incoming train records and concluded that the man had likely arrived at the Adelaide railway station by overnight train from Melbourne, Sydney, or Port Augusta. They speculated that he had showered and shaved at the adjacent city baths, though no baths ticket was found on his body. Before returning to the railway station to purchase a ticket for the 10.50 a.m. train to Henley Beach. Strangely, he did not board this train, instead checking his suitcase at the station's cloakroom before leaving the station and taking a city bus to Glenelg. It's worth noting that the city baths was not a public bathing facility but a public swimming pool, while the railway station's bathing facilities were located adjacent to the cloakroom, near the station's southern exit onto North Terrace. This discovery shed light on the man's movements but also raised more questions about his identity and the reasons behind his actions. The inquest into the death of the unidentified man, conducted by Coroner Thomas Erskine Cleland, began shortly after the discovery of the body but was adjourned until June 17, 1949. During the course of the inquest, Cleland, who was also the investigating pathologist, re-examined the man's body and made several notable observations. He found that the man's shoes were remarkably clean and appeared to have been recently polished, which was unusual given the circumstances. This observation suggested that the man had not been wandering around Glenelg all day, as his clean shoes did not match the expected condition. Cleland proposed a theory that the body might have been brought to Somerton Park Beach after the man's death, which could explain the absence of evidence of vomiting and convulsions. Vomiting and convulsions are typical physiological reactions to poison, and their absence was puzzling. Cleland's speculation about the body being moved post-mortem was purely theoretical, as all witnesses were convinced that the man they had seen the previous night was the same individual discovered the following morning. The body was found in the same place and lying in the same distinctive position. Despite this theory, Cleland still could not identify the deceased man or determine the cause of death. During the inquest, Professor Cedric Stanton Hicks, a specialist in physiology and pharmacology at the University of Adelaide, testified about the toxicity of certain drugs. He identified two drugs, referred to as number one and number two, which were highly toxic in relatively small oral doses. Hicks provided Cleland with the names of these drugs, which were entered as Exhibit C.18. However, the names of these drugs were not publicly disclosed until the 1980s because, at the time, they were easily obtainable from a chemist without requiring a specific reason for purchase. These drugs were later identified as Digitalis and Wabayan, both cardenolide-type cardiac glycosides. Hicks noted that the only missing piece of evidence in relation to the deceased was evidence of vomiting. Without it, he could not reach a definitive conclusion. Hicks suggested that if death occurred seven hours after the last observed movement, it would imply a massive, potentially undetectable dose of the toxic substance. Witnesses' accounts of movement at 7 p.m. might have been the last convulsion preceding death. Early in the inquiry, Cleland expressed his readiness to conclude that the man died from poison, likely a glucoside, and that it was not accidentally administered. However, he could not definitively determine whether the poison had been self-administered by the deceased or administered by someone else. Despite these findings and speculations, the cause of death and the identity of the man remained unresolved. After the inquest, a plaster cast was created of the man's head and shoulders. The lack of success in determining the man's identity and the cause of death led authorities to characterize the case as an unparalleled mystery and raised doubts about whether the cause of death would ever be discovered. Around the same time as the inquest into the unidentified man's death, a small piece of rolled-up paper with the words TAMAM should printed on it was discovered in a fob pocket sewn within the dead man's trouser pocket. Experts from the public library who were called upon to translate the text identified it as a Persian phrase meaning ended or finished, which was found on the last page of the book, Rebayid of Omar Khayyam. The verso side of the paper was blank. In response, the police conducted a nationwide search to locate a copy of the book with a similarly blank verso. A photograph of the scrap of paper was released to the press. Following a public appeal by the police, the copy of the Rubayit from which the page had been torn was located. A man, referred to by the pseudonym Ronald Francis and never officially identified, showed the police a 1941 edition of Edward Fitzgerald's translation of Rubaiyat, published by Whitcomb and Tombs in Christchurch, New Zealand. 
The circumstances surrounding how the book was found remain somewhat uncertain. While one newspaper article suggests that the book was discovered about a week or two before the body was found, another account suggests that it was found just after that man was found on the beach at Summerton. The timing is significant because it implies that the man may have visited Adelaide previously or stayed there for an extended period. Most accounts indicate that the book was found in an unlocked car parked in Jetty Road, Glenelg, either in the rear floor well or on the back seat. The theme of the rebellion of Omar Khayyam is centered around living life to the fullest without regrets when it comes to an end. The discovery of this book led the police to speculate that the man had committed suicide by poison, although no concrete evidence supported this theory. Notably, the words Tamam should were missing from the last page of the book, and microscopic tests confirmed that the piece of paper found in the man's pocket came from that torn page. Within the book, there were faint indentations representing five lines of text, all in capital letters. The second line had been struck out, which raised suspicions because it resembled the fourth line, suggesting a potential error in encryption. The text found in the book read as follows. Rgobad mliawitz bimpanit bex mliabo aak im samst gap. The first line's initial letter was unclear, but it is widely believed to be a W rather than an M. An X, above the last, O, in the code added another layer of mystery, and its significance remains unknown. The nature of this code and its purpose continue to be subjects of speculation and investigation, contributing to the enigma surrounding the unidentified man and his death. The strange letters found in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam initially led authorities to believe they were words in a foreign language. However, it was later recognized that the text was a code. Attempts to decipher the code were made by both code experts and amateurs, but these initial efforts were unsuccessful. In 1978, Department of Defense cryptographers analyzed the handwritten text at the request of journalist Stuart Littlemore from ABC Television. The cryptographers reported that providing a satisfactory answer was impossible due to the code's brevity. The text had insufficient symbols from which a clear meaning could be extracted, and it could have been the product of a disturbed mind. In 2004, retired detective Jerry Feltis proposed a theory that the final line, Ibn Samstgab, could represent the initials of It's Time to Move to South Australia Mosley Street. Jessica Thompson, a key figure in the case, lived on Mosley Street, the main road through Glenelg. Between 2009 and 2011, Derek Abbott's team suggested that each letter might be the first letter of a word. In 2014, computational linguist John Relling conducted an analysis that supported the theory that the letters were the initials of English text. However, he found no direct match for these initials in a comprehensive survey of literature. Relling concluded that the letters were likely written as a form of shorthand rather than a traditional code. As a result, determining the original text represented by the initials is a challenging task, and it may remain a mystery. The discovery of a telephone number in the back of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Joe Thompson raised significant intrigue in the case. Jessica Thompson lived in Mosley Street, Glenelg, which was approximately 400 meters north of the location where the unknown man's body was found. When questioned by the police, Thompson stated that she did not know the deceased man and was puzzled as to why he would have her phone number and visit her suburb on the night of his death. Thompson did reveal, however, that in late 1948, an unidentified man had tried to visit her and inquired about her through a neighbor. Jerry Feltis, a detective who worked on the case, believed that Thompson knew the identity of the Summerton man and found her to be evasive during an interview in 2002. In 1949, Jessica Thompson requested that the police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties to protect her reputation. The police agreed to this, which later complicated further investigations into the case. In various media reports and discussions about the case, Thompson was referred to by pseudonyms, including Justin, and names like Teresa Johnson Nate Powell. When shown a plaster cast bust of the dead man, Thompson could not identify the person depicted. D.S. Lean, the detective who showed her the cast, described her reaction as one of being completely taken aback, to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint. Thompson mentioned that during her time working at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of Rebellion. 
She had given this copy to an Australian Army lieutenant named Alf Boxall at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney in 1945. However, police later found Alf Boxall in Sydney in July 1949, in the final page of his copy of Rebellion, which was a 1924 edition published in Sydney, still had the words Tam Am Shit intact. There was no evidence of contact between Boxall and Jessica Thompson after 1945. The media's reaction to the discovery of the unidentified man on Somerton Beach was notable for its initial disparity between the two daily Adelaide newspapers. The Advertiser and the News The Advertiser published a brief article on page 3 of its morning edition on December 2, 1948, which mentioned the discovery of the body but offered limited information, including an assumption that the deceased might be E.C. Johnson, about 45 years old, residing on Arthur Street. Painham. The article reported that the discovery was made by Mr. J. Lyons of White Road, Somerton, with Detectives H. Strangway and Constable J. Moss conducting inquiries. On the other hand, the news featured the story on its front page and provided more details about the unknown man. As a journalist observed in June 1949, referencing a line from Rebellion, the Somerton man appeared to have deliberately left the glass empty, inviting speculation. An editorial in one of the newspapers referred to the case as one of Australia's most profound mysteries and raised questions about the rare and unidentified poison, suggesting that the perpetrator's knowledge of such substances pointed to a more serious scenario than a typical domestic poisoning. In the wake of the discovery of the unidentified man on Somerton Beach, several individuals came forward with potential identifications, sparking a series of investigations and subsequent doubts. On December 3, 1948, a day after the advertiser suggested the victim's identity, E.C. Johnson identified himself at a police station, but this identification was not confirmed. 5960. A photograph of the deceased was featured on the front page of the news on December 3, 1948, leading to numerous public calls regarding his possible identity. By December 4, 1948, police determined that the man's fingerprints did not match any records within South Australia, prompting a broader search. On December 5, 1948, the advertiser reported that the police were examining military records based on a claim that an individual had a drink with someone resembling the deceased at a Glenelg hotel on November 13. This person alleged that the mystery man showed a military pension card with the name Solomonson. In early January 1949, Two individuals identified the body as that of 63-year-old former woodcutter Robert Walsh, but a third person later changed their identification due to discrepancies in hair color. By early February 1949, eight different positive identifications of the body had been made, including claims that he was a friend of individuals from Darwin, a missing station worker, a steamship worker, or a Swedish man. Detectives from Victoria initially believed that the man might be from Victoria due to similarities in laundry marks, but this theory was later dismissed after extensive investigations. Numerous other claims regarding the man's identity emerged over the years, with 251 potential solutions proposed by members of the public by November 1953. However, the clothing he wore remained the most valuable clue in the case. Despite these attempts, the true identity of the Somerton man remained elusive and led to the enduring mystery surrounding the case. The discovery of the body of two-year-old Clive Magnuson on June 6, 1949, led to further intrigue and fear in the local community, as it appeared to have a connection to the mysterious death of the Somerton man. Clive Magnuson's body was found in a sack in the Largs Bay Sand Hills, located approximately 20 kilometers up the coast from Somerton Park. He was lying next to his unconscious father, Keith Waldemar Magnuson. The father was in a very weakened state, suffering from exposure, and was subsequently transferred to a mental hospital after a medical examination. Clive and Keith Magnuson had been missing for four days. The police estimated that Clive had been dead for approximately 24 hours when his body was discovered. The discovery of the bodies was made by Neil McRae, a resident of Largs Bay who claimed to have seen the location of the father and son in a dream the night before. Despite a thorough examination, the coroner could not determine the cause of young Clive Magnuson's death, although it was believed to be unnatural rather than from natural causes. Following her son's death, 
Roma Mangason, Clive's mother, reported being threatened by a masked man who almost ran her down outside her home in Largs North. This individual, who was driving a battered cream car, had a khaki handkerchief over his face and warned her to keep away from the police or else. A similar-looking man had been seen lurking around her house as well. Roma Magnuson believed that this situation might be related to her husband's attempt to identify the Summerton man, as he suspected the deceased man to be Carl Thompson, who had worked with him in Renmark in 1939. J. M. Gower, secretary of the Largs North Progress Association, received anonymous threatening phone calls warning that Mrs. Magnuson would meet with an accident if he interfered in the case. I. H. Curtis, the acting mayor of Port Adelaide, also received three similar anonymous phone calls warning him not to involve himself in the Magnuson affair. Police suspected that these calls may have been a hoax and that the same person might have been responsible for terrorizing a woman in a nearby suburb who had recently lost her husband in tragic circumstances. The circumstances surrounding the deaths of Clive Magnuson and the Summerton Man, coupled with the harassment and threats made toward Roma Magnuson and those seeking answers, added to the mysterious and unsettling nature of the case. The case of the Summerton Man generated significant international interest during the late 1940s and early 1950s. This interest extended beyond Australia's borders, and the South Australia Police made efforts to seek help and information from law enforcement agencies and authorities worldwide. However, these efforts did not result in a positive identification of the deceased man. The South Australia police reached out to their international counterparts, sharing information about the unidentified man and distributing his details on a global scale in an attempt to solve the mystery. They provided photographs and fingerprints of the deceased man to law enforcement agencies in various countries, hoping to find any matches or leads. Despite these international efforts, there was no successful identification of the Summerton man. For instance, in the United States, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, examined the man's fingerprint but could not find a match in their domestic criminal records. Additionally, Scotland Yard, the renowned British law enforcement agency, was approached for assistance but was unable to offer any insights or breakthroughs in the case. The inability to identify the deceased man, despite international cooperation and attention, only added to the enigmatic nature of the Summerton Man mystery. In 1949, the unidentified man was laid to rest in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery. The Salvation Army conducted the burial service, with financial support from the South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association to ensure he received a proper burial rather than being interred as a pauper. Several years after the burial, an intriguing series of events occurred at the grave site. Mysterious bouquets of flowers began to appear on the man's grave. While police questioned a woman observed leaving the cemetery, she claimed to have no knowledge of the man or the reason for the flowers. Around the same time, Anna Harvey, the receptionist at the Strathmore Hotel opposite Adelaide's railway station, came forward with an interesting detail. She recalled that an unknown man had stayed in room 21 or 23 of the hotel for a few days in late November 1948, around the time of the Summerton man's death. The man was English-speaking and had a small black case with him, which Harvey likened to one a musician or doctor might carry. When an employee looked inside the case, they found an object described as looking like a needle. In 1978, the mystery of the Summerton Man was revisited in a documentary program titled The Summerton Beach Mystery as part of ABC TV's Inside Story series. The program, hosted by reporter Stuart Littlemore, included an interview with Alf Boxall, who had no new information to provide, and Paul Lawson, the technician who created the plaster cast of the body. Lawson declined to answer a question about whether anyone had positively identified the body. In 1994, John Harbour Phillips, Chief Justice of Victoria and Chairman of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, conducted a review of the case to determine the cause of death. Phillips concluded that there seems little doubt it was digitalis, citing evidence such as organ engorgement consistent with digitalis, the absence of evidence of natural disease, and the lack of macroscopic findings that could explain the death. Former South Australian Chief Superintendent Lynn Brown, who had worked on the case in the 1940s, suggested that the unidentified man may have been from a country within the Warsaw Pact. 
This suspicion contributed to the police's inability to confirm the man's identity. The South Australian Police Historical Society possesses the plaster bust of the Somerton man, which includes strands of his hair. However, further attempts to identify the body have been hindered by the deterioration of the man's DNA due to embalming formaldehyde. Some critical pieces of evidence, such as the brown suitcase, were destroyed in 1986, and over the years, witness statements have gone missing from the police files, making it increasingly difficult to unravel the mystery. The theory that the Somerton man might have been a spy has persisted due to the circumstances and historical context of his death. Two nearby sites, the Radium Hill Uranium Mine and the Woomera Test Range, were of interest to spies during that era. The man's death coincided with a significant reorganization of Australian security agencies, which ultimately led to the establishment of the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, ASIO, the following year. This development marked the beginning of a crackdown on Soviet espionage in Australia, with the exposure of Soviet communications through the Venona Project. Another theory raises questions about Alf Boxall, who was reportedly involved in intelligence work during and immediately after World War II. In a 1978 television interview, Stuart Littlemore asked Boxall about his intelligence work and whether he had discussed it with Jessica Harkness. Boxall responded negatively and suggested that unless someone else had informed her, Harkness wouldn't have known about his intelligence activities. When Littlemore proposed the idea of an espionage connection to the unidentified man in Adelaide, Boxall characterized it as a melodramatic thesis. Boxall's Army service record reveals that he initially served in the 4th Water Transport Company before being seconded to the North Australia Observer Unit, NAU, a special operations unit. During his time with NAU, Boxall's rapid rise in rank is notable, as he was promoted from Lance Corporal to Lieutenant within just three months. These details have contributed to the speculation of espionage connections in the case of the Somerton Man. In 2011, a woman from Adelaide discovered an identification card belonging to an H. C. Reynolds in her father's possessions. This identification card was issued in the United States to foreign seamen during World War I. She contacted biological anthropologist Maché Henneberg to compare the ID photograph of H. C. Reynolds to that of the Somerton man. Henneberg observed anatomical similarities in features such as the nose, lips, and eyes, but he considered the ear's similarity to be particularly reliable. Furthermore, he found a potentially unique identifier, a mole on the cheek that had the same shape and position in both photographs. Henneberg stated that, in a forensic context, the presence of this mole would allow for a rare positive identification of the Somerton man. The ID card issued to H. C. Reynolds had the number 58,757 and indicated his nationality as British and age as 18. Despite efforts to search the U.S. National Archives, the U.K. National Archives, and the Australian War Memorial Research Centre, no records related to H. C. Reynolds have been found. The South Australia Police Major Crime Branch, which still has the case listed as open, has stated that it will investigate this new information. However, some independent researchers believe that the ID card belonged to Horace Charles Reynolds, a Tasmanian man who passed away in 1953 and, therefore, could not have been the Somerton man. In November 2013, three relatives of Jessica and Prosper Thompson the daughter of Jessica and Prosper Thompson, Kate Thompson, provided interviews to the Channel 9 Current Affairs program 60 Minutes. Kate Thompson revealed that her mother had admitted to lying to the police about not knowing the identity of the Somerton man. According to Kate, Jessica Thompson did know the Somerton man's identity, and it was also known to a level higher than the police force. She suggested that both her mother and the Somerton man might have been spies. Kate noted that her mother taught English to migrants, had an interest in communism, and could speak Russian, although she didn't disclose where or how she had acquired this skill. Roma Egan, the widow of Jessica Thompson's son Robin, and Rachel Egan, Robin and Roma's daughter, also appeared on 60 Minutes. They proposed that the Somerton man was, in fact, Robin's father and therefore Rachel's grandfather. The Egan stated that they had applied to the Attorney General, John Rao to have the Somerton man's body exhumed and subjected to DNA testing. 
In support of the Egans, Derek Abbott wrote to Rao, suggesting that exhumation for DNA testing would be consistent with federal government policies aimed at identifying soldiers in war graves, thereby providing closure to their families. However, Kate Thompson opposed the exhumation, viewing it as disrespectful to her brother. In October 2011, interest in the case resurfaced, but Attorney General John Rao denied the request to exhume the body, emphasizing the need for public interest reasons beyond mere curiosity or broad scientific interest. Jerry Feltis noted that he was still receiving inquiries from people in Europe who believed the man could be a missing relative. However, he did not believe that exhumation and identifying the man's family grouping would necessarily provide answers, as during that period, many war criminals changed their names and moved to different countries. Nevertheless, in October 2019, Attorney General Vicki Chapman approved the exhumation of the body to extract DNA for analysis. The parties interested in the analysis agreed to cover the associated costs, and the potential granddaughter's DNA was planned to be compared to the unknown man's to determine if there is a match. The exhumation was conducted on May 19, 2021, and authorities reported that the remains were in reasonable condition, offering optimism for the prospect of DNA recovery. It was discovered that the body was buried deeper in the ground than previously believed. The operation to exhume the body was part of two investigations, Operation Persevere and Operation Persist, which are focused on historical unidentified remains in South Australia. Authorities expressed their intent to obtain DNA from the remains using the latest available technology, emphasizing their commitment to resolving this long-standing mystery. Dr. and Coxon of Forensic Science South Australia highlighted that the technology available today far surpasses what was available in the late 1940s when the body was discovered, and they would employ every method at their disposal to bring closure to the case. In March 2009, a team led by Professor Derek Abbott from the University of Adelaide initiated an effort to solve the Summert and Mann case. They aimed to decipher the code found in the back of the rebellion and proposed exhuming the body for DNA testing. Abbott's investigations raised questions about the assumptions made by the police in the case, leading to new insights. For example, he researched the barber waxed cotton from the period and uncovered variations in its packaging, potentially offering clues about its origin. Regarding the code found in the rebellion, the team noted significant differences in letter frequency compared to random letters and they began testing whether alcohol could alter the distribution. They observed that the code's format appeared to follow the quatrain structure of the rebellion, suggesting it might be a one-time pad encryption. To analyze the code, they compared copies of the rebellion, as well as the Talmud and Bible, to establish a statistical basis for letter frequencies. However, the code's short length required them to locate the exact edition of the book used, which had been lost in the 1950s. The team ultimately concluded that each letter in the code was likely the first letter of a word. An investigation revealed that the autopsy reports for the Summerton Man from 1948 and 1949 were missing, and the Barsmith Library's collection of notes by Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks Cleland did not contain information on the case. Professor Mache Henneberg, an anatomist at the University of Adelaide, examined images of the Summerton man's ears and found an unusual feature where the upper ear hollow, Simba, was larger than the lower ear hollow, Kavum, a trait present in only 1-2% to of the Caucasian population. In May 2009, Abbott consulted with dental experts who identified that the Summerton man had hypodontia, a rare genetic disorder involving the absence of certain teeth, which is found in only 2% of the general population. In June 2010, Abbott obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson's eldest son, Robin, revealing that he shared the same ear characteristics as the unknown man and had hypodontia. The chance of this being a coincidence was estimated to be extremely low, between 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. This finding raised the speculation that Robin Thompson might have been a child of either Alf Boxall or the Summerton man, passed off as Prosper Thompson's son. DNA testing was considered to confirm or dispel this theory. Upon discovering that Robin Thompson had died in 2009, Abbott reached out to Rachel, the daughter of Roma Egan and Robin Thompson, who had been adopted and raised in New Zealand. Abbott and Rachel married in 2010 and have three children. They believe the Summerton man to be a family member and have a painting of him in their home. 
However, when Rachel Egan's DNA was analyzed, it was found to be linked to the grandparents of Prosper Thompson, ruling out a direct maternal connection to the Somerton man. In July 2013, Abbott released an artistic impression of the Somerton man, hoping that this might finally lead to his identification. In December 2017, Abbott reported that three excellent pairs in the right developmental stage for DNA extraction had been found on the plaster cast of the corpse. These hairs were submitted for analysis to the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA at the University of Adelaide. The results were expected to take up to a year to process. In February 2018, the University of Adelaide team obtained a high-definition analysis of the mitochondrial DNA from the hair sample, revealing that the Somerton man belonged to haplogroup H411A, a rare lineage found in only 1% of Europeans. However, Mitochondrial DNA is inherited solely through the maternal line, making it unsuitable for investigating a hereditary link between Rachel Egan and the Somerton Man. On July 26, 2022, Professor Derek Abbott and genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick announced their belief that the Somerton Man was, in fact, Carl Charles Webb Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker. Was born on November 16, 1905, in Footscray, a Melbourne suburb. This identification was based on the analysis of DNA extracted from strands of hair found in the plaster death mask created by the South Australian police in the late 1940s. The identification of Webb was made possible through investigative genetic genealogy, which resulted in matches with descendants of two distant cousins of Webb, both on his paternal and maternal sides. It's worth noting that none of Carl Webb's living relatives in 2022 had known him personally. While no known pre-death photographs of Webb initially existed, further investigation revealed a likely image of him in a 1921 Swinburne University football team photograph, although he was not directly identified in the picture. In November 2022, Australian Story unveiled photographs of Webb from the 1920s that were discovered in a Webb family photo album. Earlier, the ABC had published photos of Webb's brother, Roy Webb, claiming that they bore a resemblance to the Somerton Man. Forensic Science South Australia, which was still conducting investigations into the case, chose not to comment on Abbott's findings. South Australia police had not officially verified the result but expressed cautious optimism that this discovery might represent a breakthrough in the long-standing mystery. Carl Charles Webb was born on November 16, 1905, in Footscray, a Melbourne suburb, as the youngest of six children to his parents, Richard August Webb and Eliza Amelia Morris Grace. His father, Richard August Webb, originally hailed from Hamburg, Germany, and immigrated to Australia. He and Eliza ran a bakery in Springvale, Victoria, where Carl and his two brothers later worked. As the family bakery eventually closed, Carl Webb sought a different career path and retrained as an electrical instrument maker. In 1941, he married Dorothy Doff Robertson, who worked as a pharmacist and chiropodist. The couple resided in a flat on Bromby Street, South Yarra. Unfortunately, their marriage was marked by discord, primarily due to Carl's personality. Dorothy described her husband as solitary, moody, and prone to violent outbursts, particularly when faced with defeat in even minor matters. Despite his quiet and introverted nature, Carl had few friends and was known to retire to bed early each night, around 7 p.m. He had a penchant for poetry and composed several poems, often focusing on the subject of death, which he claimed to be his greatest desire. This fascination with death aligns with the themes found in the Rebellion. In March 1946, Carl Webb reportedly attempted suicide with an overdose of ether, and Dorothy nursed him back to health. However, his reaction was harsh and abusive towards her. By September 1946, Dorothy decided to leave her husband fleeing their tumultuous relationship. In 1947, Carl moved out, and his subsequent whereabouts remained unknown. In 1951, Dorothy was residing in Butte, South Australia, while Carl's oldest sister, Frida Grace, was married to Thomas Gerald Keane. Frida and Thomas had a son named John, who died in World War II in 1943. John's possessions, including American coins and a map of Chicago, suggested that he might have lived in the United States at some point. Both Frida Grace and Carl lived relatively close to each other, 
offering a possible explanation for the presence of American origin clothes with the name Keen on them that the Somerton man had in his possession. These items could have been passed down from his brother-in-law or nephew. Derek Abbott's research also indicated that Carl Webb had an affinity for betting on horses, raising the possibility that the coded messages in the case could be related to horse names. Overall, Abbott and Colleen Fitzpatrick believed that Carl Webb had significant mental health issues and experienced a downward spiral, potentially leading to his suicide through poisoning, in line with autopsy findings and his history. On January 4, 2022, former Adelaide lawyer Sophie Halsman put forth the nomination of Austrian milliner Carl slash Charles Joseph Halban as a possible candidate for the identity of the Somerton man. Sure, here's the timeline presented in prose format. 1902. September 17, Carl slash Charles Joseph Halban is born in Vienna, Austria-Hungary. 1905. Circa 1905. The Somerton Man is born, according to the coroner's report. November 16, Carl Charles Webb is born in Footscray, Melbourne, Victoria. 1906. April. Alfred Boxall is born in London, England. 1912. October 16, Prosper Thompson is born in central Queensland. 1918. February 28, H. C. Reynolds' identity card is issued. 1921. Jesse Harkness is born in Merrickville, New South Wales. 1936. Prosper Thompson moves from Blacktown, New South Wales, to Melbourne, Victoria, marries, and lives in Mintone, a southeast Melbourne suburb. 1945. August. Jessica Harkness gives Alf Boxall an inscribed copy of Rebellion Over Drinks at the Clifton Gardens Hotel, Sydney. 1946. Circa October, Jessica Harkness's son Robin is conceived. Late 1946, Harkness moves to Mintone to temporarily live with her parents. Early 1947, Harkness moves to a suburb of Adelaide, South Australia, and changes her surname to Thompson, the name of her future husband. April, Charles Webb leaves his wife Dorothy, whereupon she files for divorce. 1947. July, Robin Thompson is born. January 15, Boxall arrives back in Sydney from his last active duty. 1948. July, Prosper McTaggart Thompson, higher car proprietor of Mosley Street, Glenelg, appears in Adelaide local court. November 30th, the Somerton man is presumed to have arrived in Adelaide by train, buys a ticket for the train to Henley Beach but does not use it, and checks a brown suitcase into the railway station cloakroom. After 11.15 a.m., buys a bus ticket and boards a bus departing at 11.15 a.m. 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., various witness sightings. 10 p.m. to 11 p.m., estimated time he had eaten a pasty based on the time of death. 1949. January 14th, Adelaide Railway Station finds the brown suitcase belonging to the man. June 6th to 14th, the piece of paper bearing the inscription Tam Am should is found in a concealed fob pocket. June 17th and 21st, Coroner's Inquest, 1949. July 22nd, a man hands in the copy of Rubaiyat he had found on November 30th, or perhaps a week or two earlier, containing an unlisted phone number and mysterious inscription, 1949. July 26th, the unlisted phone number discovered in the book is traced to a woman living in Glenelg, Jessica Thompson, previously Harkness. July 27th. Sydney detectives locate and interview Boxall. 1950. Early, Prosper Thompson's divorce is finalized. May, Jessica and Prosper Thompson are married. 1951. Dorothy Webb reported to be living in Butte, South Australia. 1950s, the original rebellion is lost. 1953. May 18th, Horace Charles Reynolds, Tasmanian man born in 1900 and regarded by some investigators as the owner of the H. C. Reynolds ID card, dies. 1958. March 14, the coroner's inquest is continued. The Thompsons and Alf Box Saul are not mentioned. No new findings are recorded, and the inquest is ended with an adjournment sign die. 1986. The Summerton man's brown suitcase and contents are destroyed as no longer required. 1994. 
The Chief Justice of Victoria, John Harbour Phillips, studies the evidence and concludes that poisoning was due to digitalis. 1995. April 26, Prosper Thompson dies. 1995. August 17, Boxall dies. 2007. May 13, Jessica Thompson dies. 2009. March 18, Robin Thompson dies. 2019. October 14, Attorney General of South Australia grants conditional approval for the Somerton man to be exhumed in order for a DNA sample to be obtained. 2021. May 19, exhumation takes place. 2022. July 26, Derek Abbott announces that his DNA analysis has identified the man as Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker born in Melbourne in 1905. The Somerton Man is also referenced in Holly Throsby's 2018 crime novel, Cedar Valley, which features allusions to this mysterious case.